Hi, this is Paula from CHE. Today we have a panel discussion on seniors. About 30% of the population in our North Inverness region is over 65 years of age. Speaking with us are Maria Kwan from the North Inverness Health Board, Chester Muse from the Shirikam Kinsmen's Club and the Legion. He has been working on, along with partners, on extending the Meals on Wheels program for seniors. And we have Mona Poirier, Administrator at Foyer Perfuset. We will be talking about issues that seniors face in a rural community, both during the pandemic and looking ahead at the coming months. Here's our conversation. What issues are seniors facing in our community right now while the pandemic is still going on? So I wanted to start with Marie and then we can keep going. There are several issues that um, were identified during a survey that the health board did. And I think people in the community have known that these issues have always existed anyway on the long term. But to have them actually identified by the residents in the survey crystallized everything. And basically, um, one of the first things is access to healthcare services. In the community itself, um, the medical center provides wonderful care. And we are very, very lucky. We have four family doctors here. And we have really dedicated healthcare staff, both at the foyer and in the hospital setting. But the fact is that we live in a rural, isolated community. People have to travel distances, long distances, to access specialized healthcare services. And particularly in the wintertime, they're trying to do this, number one, when they may actually already be ill, such as those people traveling for dialysis. Um, they have to travel over um, challenging terrain. And that is pretty specific to our area more than uh, other areas just because of the mountains and the coastlines because what i'm talking about in our region i'm talking about people well from our catchment area as a health board from meat cove all the way down through here and our catchment area goes south into the marguerites but once you get into the marguerites you're generally your your terrain isn't as challenging and the other thing that we also have to cope with is um, pretty severe weather conditions and there have even been times when the road out of here has been closed. Uh, I remember specifically myself in the mid 90s um, the road was closed for three days and the reason I remember that is because my husband and I had been for a medical appointment in Halifax and when we tried to return from that medical appointment, uh, the causeway was closed right after our car got across. We had to stay in a motel in Port Hawkesbury and we're told by the police you cannot go to Shetty Camp because the road is blocked and that road was blocked for three days. Now, with the way the weather has been changing, this is surely going to happen again. Now, what happens to a person who is, say, on dialysis, but there's no dialysis um, facility available in the community? I mean, that has to be addressed. So that's one of the specific things as far as we have discovered. The other one is, and it all um, ties in, Poverty, um, lack of access to many things that are available in the centralized areas, in the larger urban areas, such as programming that the residents could access that could help them with their men, you know, mental health. And... Um, 
you don't have to have a mental health problem per se to require some uh, mental health tune-up. I mean, we all go through stressful times. Those programs, if they were av available, would be a preventative type of measure. Access to um, food. I mean, there are seniors who cannot cook for themselves because they're too frail to do it. And in cases, uh, they can't afford the food. But the ones who are falling through the cracks are the ones who um, don't hit the income threshold for help but they're still in a situation where they can't do it for themselves. But nevertheless, they don't have the money that could help them pay for that service. And there are too many of those people here. That's another thing that has to be addressed, but, but I'll let Mona and Chester carry on. Yeah. I agree with, with the, the items that Marie talked about. The access to food and nutritious meals, it's exactly, the, it's made worse in this time of COVID because a lot of our seniors are apprehensive, scared, worried about leaving their homes and or apartments. They're kind of worried about going to the co-op to shop. So the access to food becomes a major issue during this COVID-19 times. And we found to Meals on Wheels that the more we deliver, the more the demand increases because people, neighbors see a meal being delivered and they say, well, hey, that stops me from going to the co-op and exposing myself to risk. So therefore, I need a meal also. So access to food becomes an issue uh, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, financial ability to go to the co-op, ability to cook ability to cook a nutritious meal because some have medical issues. So there's a whole raft of issues with access to food. So, so that is an issue, uh, how to acquire food, how to get a meal, how to get an affordable meal. The second issue that COVID-19 has somewhat exposed is a, is a senior's understanding or lack of understanding of technology. So I was at the credit union yesterday and an old lady was there and she wanted access to the credit union and had forgotten that you needed an, an appointment. So consequently, her lack of understanding or the lack of ability or leveraging the technology, she needed physical contact with the credit union to do whatever financial transaction she wanted to do. So technology in this, a lack of understanding of technology in this COVID-19 scenario creates another problem. So, so the, the, the fear of COVID-19 has added a level of stress to our community at all levels, but especially at the senior level, because they don't necessarily understand some of the impact, some of the risk, what they can, can't do. So consequently, it's a big fear. So it impacts their entire life of you know, feeding, visiting, having contact with other people, banking, the whole gauntlet of how they live. So, and back to Marie's point, it undoubtedly causes mental stress that we need to be aware of so that we can touch the seniors to ensure that they feel good about themselves and they, they feel and understand that somebody else in the community is there to help them. So there is there's a lot of fear, a lot of concern, and a lot of stress on today's seniors. Can you tell me more about Meals on Wheels? Yeah, Meals on Wheels uh, up until COVID was, uh, was uh, basically uh, handled, managed, driven out of the foyer, excellent, excellent facility. And uh, they fed, and Mona can correct the numbers, I think they fed, they prepared 21 to 22 meals, uh, had a waiting list of seven or eight, so let's say 30 meals altogether. Uh, these were prepared out of the foyer kitchen, the kitchen that fed the residents and they were delivered by volunteers to the recipients. Uh, during COVID-19, for a variety of reasons, probably a major impact from COVID, uh, the foyer, uh, you know, it was, it was difficult for them to prepare the meals. So uh, through the committee that Marie and I and others are on, 
decided we would reinstate the Meals on Wheels program. So to donations from the community, some donations from the government, we have now set up a kitchen at a cafe or a Centre de Mitterrand in saint jean de moines And we've hired two cooks and they're in essence cooking similar, if not the same meals that were being prepared at the foyer. Our first day was on Monday. And those are being delivered by Lacabee, which the Lacabee delivers to the major centers, the, the Manoir, the Bellevue, the Guerroir. And then we have volunteers doing private houses in the neighborhood. Monday, we delivered 35 meals. Monday afternoon, I got a six phone calls, so we're now up to, to 41. And I'm sure after today's delivery, I'll get some more phone calls. And by Friday, we'll have more. So we're dealing with the challenges of how many we can feed, how often, what the costs are, do we have enough funding? So the Meals on Wheels is basically on Monday, you, we delivered a chicken and turnip main meal. It included a soup. Yes. So they had the soup, and in essence, most seniors will use the soup for lunch. They'll eat the potatoes and the meat for dinner or supper, whatever you want to call it. And then it included the dessert. And we try to cater by working with the foyer we tr and the medical staff. We try to cater to the medical conditions. Some are diabetic, some have heart issues, so you have to be careful with salt. So if you talk to the seniors, they say, I'm not that bad, send me a full piece of cake. But, but they, we try to cater. So uh, we're up to 41. Uh, we, uh, we have enough funding and help for up to for six months. And we're working on other funding to address the others because Meals on Wheels addresses a segment of the seniors. It doesn't address all the seniors. So, so witness uh, the, the foyer was doing 22. A waiting list of eight. We're doing 41 today, and there are others. Not only seniors, there are other what I would call vulnerable and or disadvantaged and or needy people in the community in the community that also need some form of help with meals. Be it meals on wheels, be it a, a food bank, be it other meals delivered. So we're discussing those issues and and more to come. Mona, I wanted to ask you at the foyer, um, how have you been dealing uh, with the pandemic? I think you've been uh, close to the public for over two months now, right? Yes, we're on our 12th week that we're close to the public. We had to close our doors on March 15th. So it's a long time. It's getting long for residents and families not to see each other. Uh, we're allowing vin window visits, which are helpful, but not a substitute for a face-to-face -face visit. So um, the residents are coping relatively well for the extended period that we've been closed. Um, they miss visitors. They miss our group activities. We can still do activities, but in small numbers, six feet apart. Um, they're missing going to the dining room, like the social aspect of a dining experience because they have to eat in their rooms or all on tray service. Um, our recreation department is doing wonders, doing their best to uh, keep our residents entertained and engaged. Uh, we're still having bingo, bingo in the hallways. Uh, we're having uh, prayers, uh, sing songs. Sing songs are a bit challenging because we have to increase the distance between residents because singing increases uh, droplets. So we have to have extra precautions there. But all in all, we're, we're doing all right. What challenges have you had at a facility during this time? Um, there are almost like daily challenges. Like every day somebody has a new question and it's unknown. The, the virus is new. It's unknown to everybody. And um, it's 
can we do this? Can we do that? And we always have to seek guidance or direction from the Department of Health to make sure we're following protocol, that we're not breaking any rules, that we're doing everything that we're supposed to and not doing anything that we're not allowed to. Um, and how um, do you have enough staff? How have you been doing with the staff? Yes, actually, as far as staffing, uh, we're doing much better than we've had in recent years. Like almost every day we're fully staffed. So that's a plus, especially during these challenging times. Uh, I'll come back to you afterwards, right? Right now we're doing during the pandemic and then later I'll ask you about, you know, reopening. Uh, but I wanted to ask about the, the issues that we've identified, uh, that you've identified. Do you think that there should be more uh, government programs covering these issues or what would be a solution? Now, are we talking about just during this time with the virus? Or are we talking about from here going into the future? Well, you can start with the virus and then we can move on to the future. Okay. Um, the, pro the programs that, um, the Meals on Wheels is, is what had happened early on. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Chester. Donna McDonald down at the municipality, the municipal staff, Sent as sent the service organizations, uh, the North Inverness Community Health Board, of which I'm part of, um, the fire department, RCMP, mm -hmm. and um, Wanda Chase on Sur search and rescue community services, community, community ser services, uh, right? Search and rescue, an, e an email, yeah. yeah. My asking us to on Legion and Kingsman. Yeah. Right. And then Community Matters. Right. Organizations. And asked us if we would be willing to get on a teleconference to discuss a community response team effort. And that's how all of this started. Like, um, oh, and the consite is our because Jolene was part of that teleconference, remember, Chester? Yes. And, and oh, and Georgina Poirier of St. Vincent de Paul, mustn't forget them either. Um, so during that teleconference, we discussed what was going on in the community and how we could help. And it was almost like a brainstorming activity. Almost right away, the ideas, started to come and people stepped up in particular um, Jolene who said that they had received money from New Horizons for their summer programming from seniors which they weren't going to be able to use for summer programming because of, of the restrictions but she had taken the initiative and gone back to them and said, do we have to give the money back or can we use it for something else in the community? And they said, yes, you may go ahead and use it for something productive for the community. And that's how the food hamper idea came about. And she had other people, uh, once they started that, they had other people helping like, Muriel, I don't remember. What's Muriel's last name? Uh, Lacabee. She has, uh, she's Lacabee. Yeah, and Lacabee. That, oh, and Lacabee was also, is also part of the Community Response Team Network. And so they all stepped up to do the food hamper thing, which gave breathing space to um, the Kinsman, Chester, through the Kinsman and Legion, and the Community Matters organization to go ahead and start fundraising and planning for a temporary Meals on Wheels program to replace what we had lost because the foyer had to close down. In my mind, 
that that was a wonderful effort and the efforts are still ongoing by the way and the fundraising for those programs are still continuing but your specific question was what could the government do and that's kind of what i'm getting to in a roundabout way that's what the government should have been doing they had enough time to plan when this um virus hit china I mean, we're not all naive enough to think that, you know, hopping on planes and traveling hither and yon all over the world now is, you know, <clears throat> not going to bring the viruses that start may start in one community to all of us anyway. So uh, kudos to them for what they have done, especially, you know, our provincial government and and stepping up and, and getting things in place from the healthcare side. But what was overlooked was what the knock-on effects were actually going to be in the communities. And I hope that we come out of this with lessons learned and will actually implement um, programs that will Take, start to take care of these types of issues that will crop up again. They're not going to not crop up again. No. Things are happening in the world now that, ha that have, have never really happened before. And we have to be pre prepared for any eventualities. Now, Chester, uh, as a military man, understands <laughs> operational plans and logistics so you know people like that in our communities can help the government in helping to plan for these eventualities uh, uh, covid basically highlighted the issues the issues of vulnerable seniors vulnerable families needy families, people needing help with meals, was there before. I think the COVID-19 kind of focused the attention of a group of people that can help, but it's always been there. And I'll give you an example. Out of the Legion and the Kinsmen, I ran Papa Noel last fall. We provided gift certificates to 31 families. So there was always an issue, already an issue. You know, that, that issue was there. It, it just, it made it worse because of, you know, lack of funding, lack of uh, wages, lack of work, and it's going to get worse as COVID-19 stayed with us. So, so the problem is there. It just becomes more acute. So, so there, you know, and so families need to be touched. Uh, the, the mental issues is an issue worse now. But even during Meals on Wheels, I, I was a volunteer during Meals on Wheels, and a lot of times you would deliver a meal to a, <coughs> to a lady or to a, a, a gentleman. They were as much interested in talking to you as they were about getting the meal. They just needed a contact. So, so that's one part of the, the challenges that we face. We need to find a way to touch the vulnerable, touch the seniors, because a lot of times, that's all they need. They just want somebody to say, how are you? How are you feeling? And then they ask you who you are. So, so there, there's a whole raft of requirements, I guess I would say. Some are, some are costly. Some are just very nice to do. Basically, say hi. So, so the, the COVID-19 undoubtedly has made all these issues more pressing, worse, highlighted some of them. But the vulnerable in the community were there before COVID. <coughs> the poor and the needy in the community were there before COVID. <coughs> the requirement for financial support was there before COVID-19. So, so we're, we're now talking about it because it's probably more pressing and more visible. And I, I find it interesting that, you know, a lot of community members had to step in for meals and wheels. Um, and there are other issues, you know, like, um, you were talking about technology, you know, what sort of programs could we have and how could the, you know, government step in and provide funding for that? They, they, they did, the, 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 to, be, to be fair. Uh, I, myself and my brother and Stefan Song from the school, 
uh, last fall, we got some money from New Horizons and teamed up with the foyer, Denise and, and Mona, and with the homes in the community, all the homes that were touching with Meals on Wheels, we connected with all of them. And with the money we got from the government, bought technology, Chromebooks, iPads, paid for internet for a year, and helped these seniors understand and leverage technology. But as we all know, using technology is a long process to an 80-year-old individual, man or, you know, man or woman, it's a challenging and daunting task if you've never used technology. So, so over time, I think technology will help some of these seniors connect with not only peers, colleagues, family, family members are away, and hopefully they'll feel more and more comfortable that they won't have to go to the credit union during COVID-19 to do banking. They can from home. So technology is another, another issue, another challenge. I think over time we'll get there. It, it, is, it is an issue. And we, there, is, there is technology now in all the homes, like I said, and the program paid for internet access to all the homes for at least a year. So, so we're getting there, slowly but surely. How many homes? Uh, how many? But the homes are. The, uh, when I talk about a home, I talk about a, a complex like like the Manoir, the Bellevue, the two uh, buildings that the Giroir around the dollar store. So there's one, two, two of the Manoir that's four. The Bellevue is five. So in, just in the Shetty Camp, San Jose of Nguyen, there are five. I'm not talking about the long-term care like the foyer. These are homes where seniors live. So there are five. Uh, Mona, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, the government is speaking about reopening everything as of June the 5th and other services later on. Have you, did, do you have any news? Do you think if you'll be able to open to the public? Not yet. Uh, we had a sector conference yesterday, as we do every Tuesday, and uh, officials from the Department of Health have indicated that they've begun discussions about uh, reopening uh, continuing care to visitors. They only started talking about it last Friday and it would only be supervised outdoor visits that we're talking about for now. But they said that they're not there yet. And we asked if there was a date that we could anticipate uh, being allowed outdoor visits and they couldn't answer that yet. They don't know yet. What are some of the needs that you see for the foyer for the future? So after this, this time, or even let's say after you reopen, immediately after you reopen, what are some of the challenges and needs you would have then? Um, once we reopen, it will be possibly challenging uh, to make sure that visitors abide by the new normal. Uh, visitors will need to be screened and have their temperature checked once they come in. Uh, they'll need to wear a non-medical mask. So uh, all th these visits will need to be sort of overlooked to make sure everybody is abiding by the rules and that we're protecting our residents at all times. And how about for afterwards? Do you think that something has changed? I'm hoping that government will see that uh, there's a great need in long-term care for infrastructure uh, investment uh, to create private rooms and private bathrooms for residents in long-term care to minimize the spread of virus infection control measures. I think, I think we're all in agreement there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've heard, for example, Trudeau said that um, he wanted to get 10, day, 10 sick days for staff, uh, for essential workers. Have you heard anything about that from the province? No, I haven't, but uh, we're a unionized workplace and all our, our staff, uh, once they reach part-time status, they do earn sick time and a full-time person earns 18 sick days a year, which accumulate so we've already had that in our facility. Can I ask Mona a question? Mona, uh, 
my involvement with the kinsmen and the legion uh, and other organizations uh, would indicate that as the population in the community gets older, volunteers are more difficult to get. So do, do you foresee an issue or a challenge with the foyer in the long term or what keeping the number of volunteers you, you have? And I'm, I'm, I think you do appreciate the volunteers that's up there. Do you see a challenge in getting a new volunteer? Because uh, we find that very difficult at this time to get people to come out and help. Not yet, not for the foreseeable future. We have volunteers, we have one volunteer that's in her 90s and she's probably the volunteer that donates the more most time to the foyer. Um, most of our volunteers are retired and um, are still like young retirees for some of them. So it will probably, be a challenge in five to ten years from now but for the foreseeable future I think we're all right okay and now I wanted to ask about the future um, after the pandemic and even after the, the reopening um, what what type of help would you like to see I guess from governments right what type of programs would you like to see the sign for them uh, for the community I know um, I, because of what happened with our survey and the results of the survey and um, what we uncovered were the needs in the community um, to address uh, the priorities that were identified by the community. The first was access to health care. The second was, um, let me just bring up the, the health plan that was made from the... Uh, this is the health plan, by the way, that was, it's bilingual, that was made from the surveys and the needs of the residents. Um, we have access to health services in our rural isolated communities, was number one. <clears throat> Economic conditions, food and poverty was number two. Education and physical activity was priority number three, because the community, community understands that there are preventative measures that they themselves can take to um, address um, their own health situation to keep them well for as long as possible. But uh, we have to help them do that. As far as economic conditions, food and poverty, which was the number two priority, and I haven't addressed that yet, is um, the community health boards uh, now are lobbying the government uh, provincially and federally for a universal basic income. And that's going to be, as far as that goes, a lot of our focus is going to be going on that. But we're also, um, as a health board, we're mandated to lobby or advocate, is the word, I shouldn't say lobby, advocate for our communities. Because we're on the ground and understand best what is actually happening on the ground with our residents. And we take that to the higher levels and we advocate or what is needed in the communities. And um, one of the other things that we're trying to bring here are commu the community health teams programs. And some of those address uh, the mental health issues that people, you know, help people reduce stress and anxiety, teach them how to do that. Uh, some of them, teach budgeting. Some of them teach people how to cook healthy. So we're trying to bring in some of those programs. But interestingly, what they have found is some of those programs are now being offered online. So you can actually do some of that work virtually too. And the first one, of course, is the access to health services, the specialized care. And um, we suggested that Perhaps the um, 
you know how the mammogram bus comes and, and regularly regular intervals and does mammograms there's probably some other programs that can be serviced that way and brought to the rural communities we're uh, lo actually lobbying and I will use that word here for a dialysis service to be provided in our communities and uh, there's an Another lo there's another group locally that are also working on this as well. Our vulnerable communities, and those are the ones that can't afford to travel these distances. So it all comes down again to the universal basic income. Because if we're not going to have the specialized health care services available in the communities, which we know we can, there is no way. Uh, the government doesn't have piles and piles and piles of money. So there has to be a happy provider in the communities. Then they have to provide a way to be able to transport these those people to get to those appointments. But as much as possible, also find a way to provide the services that they can bring to the communities and the, the virtual appointments actually have been an eye-opener as well in, in, in as much as they know that now some of their services where a patient doesn't have to be present in person for a physical examination can actually be taken care of through a virtual means but then again we also have to remember that not everyone is up to speed with technology or has it available. There's a whole lot of factors that have to be taken into consideration when you're looking at this. Uh, I think uh, uh, now and, and in the future, uh, I think the government needs to find a way to help communities, not just Shade Camp, all other communities to ensure that people are provided nutritious meals, especially the vulnerable amongst us. So the feed Nova Scotia concept, we need to look at a feed shelly camp concept whereby we ensure that those that need meals can't afford them, can't go to the co-op, can't cook, whatever, for a variety of reasons, we need to find a way to help those, not only seniors, but uh, anybody that's vulnerable who needs help. So we, we, that's an issue. I think I think shelly camp is probably a, an issue of lack of, of what I would call rental spaces. I think, I think if Shelly Camp is going to grow, they're going to have to solve the, uh, the, the issue of available housing, I guess, if, if you want to call it that. I think uh, uh, the, the foreign workers come to Shelly Camp is a great thing. I think it's helped uh, some of the industries. Unfortunately, when they come to Shelly Camp, they tend to leverage and or use any available rentals. So it, it, those that would want to come from away from Toronto to live in Shelly Camp can't because there's nothing to rent. So that, I think that's a challenge in the future. And notwithstanding uh, Mona's uh, luck with getting good volunteers at the foyer, I think the organizations that I'm involved with are, are really in dire need of new blood and young blood joining our organization. So uh, that would be a plea, I think, in the future to have more and more different people, young people, different ideas join the organizations that, that are helping the community. And that, that would be my three kind of concerns or wish, uh, wish list if I, if I had one. As Chester was speaking, he tweaked something in my memory that I've been thinking about over the last few days too. Well, now actually there's two things. Um, one of them is the Community Response Team Network would invite other organizations or people to actually join the network. Um, you can just give us your, your names and contact information. And I say this especially to the youth groups, patients from every part of our population, because the community response team network is actually going to stay in touch even after this is over. Because I think this is a, a valuable resource that our communities have been missing. And keeping that response team network together and, and working together with goals will really help us in the future even after 
the uh, pandemic has gone. The other thing I'm very concerned about now is our seasonal workers. I'm worried about, number one, they say there's a second wave coming in the fall. And we already have vulnerable populations that we know need to help now. But those seasonal workers who are not making their stamps for EI for the fall and winter, we're going to have um, a real bulge in the numbers of families in this community. We're going to be in dire straits. And I think um, the government has to look at addressing that problem because you don't want them kind of trying to catch up suddenly when it's too late and these families are already suffering. So if anyone has any ideas about how to go about doing that, let's start thinking caps on and, and uh, try and solve this together and again, get in touch. Um, I'll give, Paula, I'll give you the information later for the contact for that. Mona? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yes. Anything that you'd like to add? Any final thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, uh, staff recruitment and retention will always be a challenge for the foyer. Uh, Right now, today, we're not doing so bad, but we have an older staff and uh, we have to struggle at times to fill positions. So that's going to be an ongoing challenge, I imagine. Okay, Chester, any final thoughts? Well, I, I, well <laughs> in addition to my point, uh, I see a uh, uh, Marie is having uh, technology challenges, not herself personally, but the Wi-Fi seems to go in and out. So uh, it, it, underlying discussions about uh, using technology in the community or doing uh, telehealth or doing remote uh, help is going to need some good technology. And we're, we need an improved uh, Wi-Fi network in the community and an improved uh, cell network in the community. So, those are technology challenges that the government's going to have to help us with. We thank our guests for participating in the panel, and we thank you for watching. You can write to us at chne.television at gmail.com.